niche for the name, finally. Um, we all love trees, um, that's why we're here, uh, and we want to have more of them in our landscape. But what I want to throw out today are some ideas that might make you think differently <coughs> about what kind of trees we want in our landscape, what landscape, and how best to bring them back. Um, I think we tend, when we think of, of, of forest, we tend to think of a closed canopy forest. It's something that we've grown up with, it's imbued in us since we've heard tales of Hansel and Gretel and Little Red Riding Hood. Um, it's also a story that is embedded, or has been, in the last couple of centuries at least, in the scientific thought. So it's a story about um, a squirrel being able to run from John O'Groats to Land's End without ever touching the ground and just bouncing on the canopies of the trees. That's that's the sort of image we have of temperate zone Europe before human impact. Um, it's also a story that is very anthropocentric because it's bound up with these Freudian overtones. Um, so it's all about man coming along, finding this, this intact forest, chopping it down with his axe, um, opening it up to the light, conquering the slathering beasts, and then opening up the virgin land to sow his seed. So this is a kind of, you know, it's a very penetrating myth, and it's, it's something that really has, has kind of taken hold over our subconscious, really. Um, and for those of us who care deeply about the environment and about nature, um, this idea of an unfathomable, prolific, generous, pristine forest has become the holy grail of what to go to for nature. Um, when we look at the, the sort of depleted, um, over-exposed um, landscape around us that humans have changed so hugely, um, this idea of the primal forest has, has come to be something that we want to, the kind of go-to goal. But I think that it's very important that we look at this again, because if we're to understand how to conserve the nature in the future, we've got to have a better understanding of what nature was here in the past. And I'm not saying that we need to go back to the past. We can't. Um, in the Anthropocene, we have changed our environment so dramatically, so profoundly, that we can't go back to those systems, let alone recover some of the species that with the many species we've lost. But by looking at the past and the dynamism, the, the processes that went on in the past, we can hope to mimic them in the present. We can use tools that are still at our disposal to create something interesting, new ecosystems perhaps, for the future that will help protect our planet. So there's an easier, much cheaper, much more effective way of re-establishing trees in our landscape than simply putting a spade in the ground. And that's something that is much, much greater um, for benefits for biodiversity, and that's what I'd like to, to talk about um, today. It's part of a system that has come to be known as rewilding. Um, my husband and I, <laughs> Um, first got interested in rewilding um, uh, on our estate in, in Nep, uh, Nep estate in Sussex. It's um, just 44 miles south of London, underneath the Gatwick stacking system, so we're getting a hell of a lot of nitrogen pouring from the skies upon us. Um, but uh, uh, we inherited this um, arable, intensive arable and dairy farm from Charlie's grandparents um, in the 1980s. It was already a failing farm. Uh, we took it on in our 20s with a kind of verve and vigour and youth and thought we could turn it around. Um, this is what it looked like. Oh, no, that's not what it looked like. That's what it looked like. Well, it did look like both. Um, but this is what it looked like. And um, every single inch of it had been ploughed up um, since the Second World War. So we are on grade three, grade four agricultural land. But during the dig for victory, um, everything that was available was ploughed up. And we had just carried on doing that. And I think it's important to realise that this is a transformation that has really happened across our countryside in the last 60 to 70 years. Um, before that, our, our landscape looked very, very different. We tend to think of it as the new normal. But actually, look back a century ago, and our landscape would have been very, very different indeed. <coughs> I have to look at the figures here because I can never keep them in my head because they seem so completely um, uh, outrageous. We've lost 75,000 miles of hedgerows since the Second World War and 97% of our wildflower meadows. 90% of our wetlands have gone and 80% of our lowland heathland. In 1966, so when I was a toddler, 
Um, there were 40 million more birds in our skies than there are today. We tend to think that this is something, you know, that, well, it's happening all across the globe. It's happening everywhere. It's, there's something almost sort of um, inevitable about it. Um, but that is not the case. Uh, in, in 2016, the State of Nature brought out a report where they identified um, this, this the Biodiversity Intactness Index. And they scrutinized 218 different countries. The UK was 29th from the bottom. So we are one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world. It is down to us. Oops. Oops. So um, when we took over, um, the, the, the Dicker Victory campaign was really only ever intended as a solution for a crisis. We were facing starvation, we were isolated, we were severed from our normal trade routes, our, our normal markets. This was a response to crisis. It was never meant to be a sustainable form of agriculture into the future. But then, as farmers, we got hooked on subsidies. And then we joined Europe. Europe was hooked on subsidies, thanks largely to the French farmers. And we continued in this extraordinary sort of steam train towards churning every single bit of our land, irrespective of it, whether it was appropriate or not, into mainly arable. Um, I think when we took over in the 1980s, the, the subsidies, the UK subsidies that were given to farming were something like 57% of the entire U, uh, uh, EU budget. Um, absolutely astonishing. I think now it's down to about 41 or 39%, something like that. But it's still huge. So you've got this very artificial driver compelling people to, to produce um, food from land that is not appropriate. When we took over, NEP was already a failing farm. Um, uh, and it was intensive, intensive arable and dairy. For 17 years, we did everything we possibly could to try and turn it around. So we bought bigger machinery, we invested in different types of crops, experimented with different methods, we um, bought bigger animals, bigger cows, Holsteins and, and Frisians that could produce more milk, we amalgamated dairies, we invested in infrastructure, and we even experimented with diversifying into ice cream and sheep's cheese and all sorts of things like that. Above all, we put more and more and more chemicals on the land, so more fertiliser in the form of nitrates, um, more, uh, more pesticides, more fungicides, more herbicides. We threw everything we could at the land. And after 17 years, we were still no, not making a profit, and uh, we, were hundred, we were one and a half million in debt. The reason, as always, was our Sussex clay. If anyone knows the, the low wheeled here, um, <laughs> you can sympathise, because it is, we, we sit on 320 metres of clay over a bedrock of, of limestone. And it's unfathomable porridge in the winter, and in the summer it bakes as hard as, as, as concrete. Um, I think the Inuit are supposed to have dozens of different words for different types of snow, but in the old Sussex dialect we have dozens of words for, for mud. That's how much it dominates our lives. You literally, in a, in a winter that we've, like we've just had, very, very wet, you cannot get machinery onto that ground for about six months of the year. So basically we cannot compete with in a global market on with farms that are larger and on lovely loamy soils. We just we just can't compete. So we decided to give up farming. Um, selling wasn't an option for us. This is an estate that's been in the family for over 200 years. Um, but we wanted to do something that worked with the land rather than battling against it all the time. And just about the time that we were um, selling the farm machinery, selling up um, the cows, very, very black days. Um, we, we met this wonderful man, Franz Führer. Uh, he's a Dutch or, uh, ecologist. Uh, he's, what, he's, in 2000, just the year after we'd sold the farm, the, sold the, the farm machinery and stopped farming, his book, Grazing Ecology and Forest History, was published in English. It's not an easy read, it's not a light read, but what he is saying is absolutely astonishing, and it's still sending shockwaves through the scientific and the sort of conservation community. Because what Franz is saying is that in all our imaginings of how temperate zone Europe looked before human impact, we've forgotten about the huge herds of roaming animals that would have been here. We've forgotten about elk, bison, aurochs, tarpan. Uh, we've forgotten about wild boar. We've forgotten about beavers by the million. And all these animals would have been in our landscape um, and we're, we either made them extinct or pushed them to the borders of extinction, in the, in the case of the bison and the beaver, 
um, as we started taking over the land and cultivating it and settling it. I have to keep. So these are the animals that we, that we had. Um, amazing, amazing to think that we had five different species of bison. Um, only one is left and clinging on by its fingernails, but now thankfully bouncing back in rewilding projects across Europe. Um, what is really interesting is that these animals recolonized our lands after the last ice age, 3,000 years before trees did. So they got here first. They've been here from the year dot, and they have co-evolved with our native species. So they are, they are interlinked, they're completely combined the way they work with our vegetation and with our native species. So they're, they're, they are drivers of our ecosystems, if you, if you like. The way they disturb, the way they trample, the way they rootle, the way they graze and browse. All their effects on the vegetation are crucial for biodiversity. It's what makes the messy margins, the, the mosaic of habitats, a much more open habitat than, than a closed canopy forest. Much more interesting for species and much, much more dynamic. They are basically what keep our lands, kept our landscape from, from being turning into closed canopy forest. And one of the prime indicators of this is our fantastic oak. It's the, it's the icon of the British countryside. It is in our cultural DNA. Um, it cannot re regenerate in closed canopy conditions. It just can't do it. So it needs light to produce acorns and to produce um, viable seed. And just the way it spreads out, it, you can see it is a sun-loving creature. Its, it's, <laughs> its limbs spread out in, in lateral um, sun salutation. It's providing 360 degrees of habitat. So we, we, we think that at least 2,200 species live on an oak, um, depend on an oak for food and for habitat. Um, 300 species and subspecies of lichen alone and because this, this tree lives to can live to a thousand years or more, you've got dead wood habitat within that living frame. So you've then got saprocylic beetles, you've got all the sort of nooks and crannies for bats, for, for nesting and roosting for birds. And of course it produces acorns. A hundred thousand acorns a year a, a mature tree, a oak tree can produce. So that's a huge resource in terms of food for small mammals, but as well as, as deer and, and, and wild <laughs> boar in, in the old days. So these old biological associations with this tree indicate that the oak is not just simply a new arrival. It has been in our landscape from the year dot. And it has very, very complicated and complex biological associations. But it's not just the oak that's like demanding. Um, species like ha uh, hazel and birch and all our fruit producing shrubs like crab apple, wild cherry and wild plum, all these need open light conditions in order to regenerate. So when you find these species in your pollen samples, um, when you're looking at what happened in the past, they are indicators of a much, much more open landscape. So far from being this ubiquitous forest that we have in our heads, the place that you, we used to, that, that the, the landscape that used to be here, these light demanding trees are telling us, um, is a much, much more open landscape. And in places it would have been much more like the Serengeti. So here you have um, your, your great tight grazing lawns, you've got um, heathland, you've got stands of trees, groves of trees, open grown trees, you've got boggy bits, you've got naturalized natural river systems. Um, it's a very, very complex and very, very interesting and sh ever shifting landscape. So fantastic for biodiversity. What Vera is saying, therefore, in the modern day, is if we want to recover some of these cataclysmic losses that we've been encountering, both in terms of biodiversity and our environment and our soils, the way to do it is to um, allow free-roaming animals, free-roaming herbivores back into the landscape at big scale and let them manage this process for you. Let them kickstart natural processes and amazing things will start to happen. So we were really intrigued by this, and we thought we'd do an experiment to see if what he said worked. Um, our um, uh, estate is divided into three different areas, rather unimaginatively called the northern, the middle, and the southern block. Um, the southern block is really where we've seen Vera's, Vera's theory spring to life. 
Um, this is an area that has become so exciting that we have some of um, uh, the UK's, if not Europe's, most rarest species. It's now home to turtle doves and nightingales and purple emperors, amongst many, many more species. And this is what it looks like. Um, the reason this area um, is so dynamic and so exciting for wildlife came about completely by accident. Um, the, the northern block and the middle blocks um, were associated with ancient parkland. The middle block with the Repton Park, the northern block with a much older uh, park in King John's time. So we very quickly got um, funding to restore these areas. Um, and so we got funding from Countryside Stewardship to restore parks, basically. And we, we uh, ring-fenced those areas and we released our free-roaming animals into them. Exciting things are happening, and there's no doubt, doubt about it. We've got peregrines, we've got goshawks, we've got wonderful small mammals, we've got dung beetles, lots of exciting stuff. Um, but with, this, with the southern block, we couldn't attract funding because it wasn't shown historically to have been associated with the park, and that was the funding we'd been chasing. And we weren't having any luck at, um, attracting HLS higher level stewardship funding because we weren't in a target area. So we were completely at a loss what to do with this um, 1,200 acres of the southern block. We didn't have the money to ring fence it, and nor did we have the money to re-sow with wildflowers and, and native grasses. So after the last harvest of each field, over a period of about four years, we just left the fields be as they were. So they've been um, planted with maize and harvested, we just leave it, barley, wheat, whatever. We just left it. So what happened in the interim, interim time was you suddenly got this extraordinary veg vegetation pulse. Suddenly we were seeing um, hawthorn, bramble, dog rose, blackthorn pumping up in the middle of these fields. And our hedgerows were just billowing out like dowagers released from their stays. They were just <laughs> loving it, move, moving out, marching into the fields. And in some places we were seeing sand, stands of sallow coming up. It was all very random because the, the fields had been taken out at different times and the responses were all to do with what the weather was like, the last year for seeds, what, um, uh, what the history of that soil was. Um, so it was very complicated. We still haven't worked out why each field has responded differently. But what's happened is you've got this interesting mosaic of habitats, of different types of shrub coming back into, into the landscape. And because of that, we suddenly started seeing amazing amounts of birds. And obviously, birds are our charismatic species. They're very visible, so they're easy to count. And they're very, very good indicators of what else is going on. So when you see birds, you know that you've got fantastic insects, you know you've got fantastic flora, and small mammals, perhaps, as well. But what we started seeing suddenly were, uh, were, were clouds of field fairs, meadow pipits, and red wings. These were winter visitors we'd never seen before. Um, and we were, we were seeing them in huge numbers feeding on the berries and insects in this kind of habitat. Um, bullfinches, a bird that had just declined 35% in between the years 95 to 2010. Um, this was, is back in numbers and it's feasting again on, on buds and blackberries and seeds. Suddenly we had woodlarks, skylarks, woodcocks, snipe, and in summer yellowhammer, that lovely little, little bit of bread no cheese coming out at us from all this wonderful thorny scrub. That's had a drop 60% nationwide since the 1960s. And most exciting of all, we were suddenly hearing nightingales again. Um, we had only heard them very intermittently in the past. Now we would, could with confidence take friends out after dinner at 11 o'clock at night in May, and we could hear three or four males competing with each other, throwing their voices up into the, into the night sky. It's absolutely magical. And now we do nightingale tours. Um, um, safaris, and, and, and most people have never heard a, a nightingale on UK soil. Um, in 2007, even more exciting, we heard our first turtle dove. For us, this is absolutely key, because this is the most likely bird to go extinct within our shores, according to the RSPB, within the next 15 to 20 years. So the fact that we have turtle doves coming back onto our land, and this year we had 18 singing males, and we know they're breeding because we've even tagged their fledglings, the fact that we have turtle doves coming back on our depleted soils at NEP, underneath the Gatwick stacking system, surrounded by, by urban urbanisation and all these roads, if, if something as miraculous as that can happen on our land, it can happen anywhere, I assure you. We've now got 13 out of 18 UK species of bat, two of them so rare we hardly know anything about them at all, including Becksteins, which is rare in, in Europe. 
Um, and we've got um, five, all five UK species of owl. Um, and we've also now are beyond any shadow of a doubt, the, by far the biggest breeding colony of UK of purple emperors in the UK. Um, one of our rarest butterflies and one of our most um, dramatic and exciting species. And this has come back because of our groves of sallow, its, its food source. So now we were even more worried about what to do with this southern block than before. Because if, as any farmer knows, if you allow that scrubland just to simply be, without any intervention whatsoever, with no animals, whatever, it will just turn into closed canopy woodland. And we would lose all these remarkable species that had come back. So we were desperate for that not to happen. Um, and it is important here to, to emphasize Something I think that um, a lot of people tend to overlook in our, in our sort of romance about woodland. Closed canopy woodland is very species poor. I was very interested to hear Martin talk about that, that, that it makes it easier for, to do scientific monitoring and research. But there's a reason for that, and that is that most of our species need like conditions for at least some part of their life cycle. 90% of our species in Europe need to be in the open like conditions. Very, very few birds will tolerate closed canopy woodland. If you go to somewhere, for example, like Lady Park Wood in the Forest of Dean, or to Men's Nature Reserve, these are scraps of what is held up to be ancient primal forest in the UK. When you, and these are very closely monitored by scientists. What you find is that biodiversity is just on a trajectory like this. Even now, it's still continuing to fall. And these are very, very closely monitored. If you go to Bielogratia in Poland, where spirits really run high about this, this supposed last ancient primal scrap of, of uh, forest in, in, in Europe, you walk through those woods. Most of them are plantations, about 200 years old. They're old plantations. But they are not natural regenerated forest. And it is silent. There's nothing there. You may have fantastic um, fungi. You may have fantastic saprocytic insects and beetles but you won't have birds, you don't have flora in any interesting um, quantities. Um, so trees on their own are not the answer. Thankfully, um, uh, because of all these amazing birds and things that were coming back to the Southern Block, we got uh, funding in 2009 um, from high level stewardship. Um, and bizarrely, now that we've got funding, um, we are now an area that is a, a, a target for HLS funding. It's a bizarre thing of the tail wagging the dog. You know, if you haven't got it, you can't get it. And once you've got it, every, everyone can get it. I don't know how HLS works. But anyway, thankfully, we are now um, encouraging areas around us to, 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 for, to get HLS projects underway as well. But this, this money now um, uh, allowed us to ring fence the area and to introduce free roaming animals. Um, the animals we've introduced are, are representative of at least some of the mouths that were in that landscape before. Obviously, we, we hunt, hunted to extinction the, the, the aurochs and the tarpan. We don't have bison, we can't introduce wild boar, but we can use proxies of them. And that's really important because they can, they can be the, the, the spirit of the ghost's past, if you like. Um, we didn't introduce sheep and goats because they are a relatively late introduction by man from Mesopotamia, that's where they came from originally. So our, our vegetation has less ability to defend itself against grazing and browsing by sheep and goats. So they were out of the picture. Here I was going to show you some video clips, but I'm afraid uh, technical hitch, we, <coughs> we, can't, we can't get the video to work. Um, but this is an old English longhorn, so um, it's standing in as a proxy for the aurochs. Um, it looks the part, it's got fantastic um, great horns. Um, and why it's important, um, it's an old breed, so obviously it can, it can survive outside all year round without supplementary feeding. We don't, we don't give any attention to these animals at all unless they need veterinary attention, which they rarely do because they're so healthy and we think they kind of self-medicate and they're in their natural environment anyway. They're browsing on what they want to eat. Very important that these animals browse as well as graze. Cattle don't eat grass. They much prefer to eat a mixture of of browsing as well as grazing. And that's so important because of the impact on, on the habitat. They can carry up to 230 different seed species in their gut and their hooves and their, and their fur. So they're a hugely important vector for other species of plant to move across the landscape. They'll eat in one place, walk sometimes miles, 
um, dung it out in another one, a perfect, perfect pile of compost ready to take off again. So animals, we've completely forgotten in our static kind of game over way of treating livestock just in one place and taking them off the land, putting them on, taking them off. We've forgotten that this whole motion of, of migrating animals through our landscape was a way that nutrients and minerals moved from one place to another, from the sea to the tops of mountains. And we've also forgotten, of course, about the importance of corpses, of, of, of those bodies rotting down and returning those minerals and nutrients into the soil, something we don't allow these days, and we would like to allow it next, but we'll see if that will happen. Um, we also introduced, um, oh, and of course, dung. So the, the, if you're thinking about soil restoration, hugely valuable, these, these, these animals, because now we're not feeding them avermectins, the wormers, the, the antibiotics that are routinely given to livestock in intensive systems. You've got this dung that is high in nutrients, ready to be pulled back into the soil by species like dung beetles, the specialists. Dung beetles are a keystone species, and my husband Charlie, who's a bit of a nut about dung beetles, I have to say, <laughs> You can imagine what our kitchen looks like sometimes. But he, he once discovered 23 different species of dung beetle in a single cow pad. Um, we've got a dung beetle that hasn't even been seen in Sussex called um, violet, the violet door be beetle, Geotrupes mutator, that hasn't been seen in Sussex for 50 years. How it finds us, I just don't know. But there it is everywhere now, doing its work, pulling the, the dung back into the soil and regenerating our soils for us. Um, uh, then, did I miss out the <coughs> lovely long, um, Exmoor ponies? Exmoor ponies standing in for the tarpan. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the cave paintings of Lascaux about 17,500 years ago. On the, on the walls of those caves in France is a pony that looks exactly like this. It's a very ancient breed, very hardy, um, been here forever. Um, and again, it can survive out in our, con our conditions, no problem, all year round. But it's another mouthpiece in the landscape, so it eats completely different things. Um, I've got some great footage of it eating thistles and all sorts of unimaginable things that the cows just simply can't stomach. So there's a lovely relationship between equines and bovines, where the equines eat all the tough stuff that the ca cows can't stomach, enabling the, the sweet grasses to come up. So I love this picture in my head of of tarpan moving through a landscape in times past with the aurochs following behind, um, taking advantage of, the, of the, the species that the tarpan has facilitated. Um, and then we have um, roe deer, um, red deer and um, fallow deer, same story really, different mouthpieces, different ways of disturbing the land. Red deer, particularly heavy hitters, we think they were actually a riverine species originally. When you see them at net with plenty of water to be in, they're almost entirely always in the water. We think that they, you know, as, as a man took over the river systems, they pushed red deer out up into the, into the mountains where they don't really want to be. Naturally, they're probably much more like a, a pear david or a sitatunga. They're, they're a kind of animal that likes to be always in water. But they are very heavy hitters, and so, like bison, they can ring bark trees in the winter. Um, so they have a big in impact on vegetation. And then pigs, and I'm so, so sad you can't see this video, because um, it does show the pig um, diving in, our, in our, our ponds and lakes. They behave like hippos. I mean, it's amazing when you see animals that you, you, you're used to seeing in a farmyard or a boring green field um, allowed to express themselves. They do all sorts of incredible things. And these, can, they can hold their breath for 20 seconds, and they dive down and pull up swan mussels from the bottom of our lakes. How they know they're there, I, I don't know. <laughs> Huge opportunities, very, very clever. But what they're doing is they're rootling up the soil, exposing the sward. So if you've got a thick, grassy sward, if you've got permanent pasture, it's very, very difficult for other species to come in and colonise that. But the pigs will open up the sward um, in little patches, allowing these native plants and species, including our beautiful, tiny, I'm not going to call them weeds ever more, our native wildflowers that... Um, species like turtle doves depend on things like scarlet pimpernel, plumetry, and, and all of those. Um, and then, um, ah, okay. <laughs> so, um, because we had um, left the Southern Block um, 
uh, alone for five or six years, um, it, the vegetation, the thorny scrub, had had a chance to establish. And it had a... What's happened there? Uh, um, the thorny scrub had had a chance to establish, so it was able to build up tannins to resist some of the browsing, and it also had um, the ability to produce thorns. We see crab apples, naturally regenerated crab apples in this landscape. They will produce sticks that are actually like thorn. When they're browsed, their response is to build sticks like thorns. It's absolutely astonishing to see. And the more that the animals browse, the more, the more robust the scrub becomes. Um, they, are, they have evolved, essentially, to take heavy browsing. And that is why we're able to coppice. So, um, you know, if you cut hazel, oak, ash, willow, field maple, sweet chestnut, they all bounce back in profusion. Because what we're doing when we're coppicing and pollarding is mimicking the disturbance of these ancient me megafauna. And actually, pollarding and coppicing can prolong the life of trees. That's what's so interesting. The, the response is actually... Um, um, that they can actually prolong the, the biological life of these trees. So what's happening here is two processes, two natural processes that are, that are present in the landscape um, and, and need to be in balance. You've got vegetation succession, so your scrub going up into closed canopy woodland, and you've got animal disturbance. If you've got the two battling it out together, then you have this really exciting sort of war going on, which produces different habitats, different responses, a mosaic of, 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 of vegetation responses, which is bi rocket fuel for biodiversity. If you have one without the other, if you have vegetation succession, but no animal disturbance, you get boring closed canopy woodland. If you get too many animals and no, no response, of able, the, the scrub's not able to respond, then you just get open grassland, again, very species poor. So this is what you want. You want enough animal disturbance and enough robustness in your vegetation to get that dynamism going, to get the whole thing kicking off. So how can trees establish themselves in the pre presence of grazing and browsing animals? Well, this is something that we've completely forgotten in the present day. The key is thorny scrub. It's a habitat that has almost entirely disappeared from our landscape today. We look at this sort of land um, today and you would call it wasteland. It's good for nothing. Farmers certainly abhor it. Um, but it wasn't always like that. And, it, and not so long ago, um, this kind of landscape had huge value. From medieval times onwards up until the First World War, we got things like um, walking sticks, tool handles, fuel, charcoal, fodder for animals, uh, we used to get medicines, dyes, tanning, uh, baskets, gunpowder, brooms, you name it. And you only have to look back into our old field names to, to see that this sort of um, landscape was actually valued. It was valued and managed as a crop. Um, at NEP we have names like Brummer's Corner, Benton's Gorse, Bramble Field, Rushets, Little Thornhill, Stub Mead, High Reeds, and numerous furs fields. Furs is a old um, English word for gorse. Um, everywhere we have furs fields. Um, so thorny scrub is also key to establishing trees, and that was again one of its values that it was treasured for. Um, when we, by the time we'd got the fence built around the southern block and we introduced our grazing animals, our browsing animals, we'd already had tens of thousands of saplings, oaks, had popped up in that area. I mean, tens of thousands, everywhere you looked, there were little oaks. Those, the ones that were out in the open, in the grassland, were very quickly browsed off by the animals. And these oaks, by the way, had come from the jay. Um, and we know that the, the association between the joke, jay and the oak, but the jay can actually plant 7,500 seeds in um, acorns in four weeks. I mean, it's a prolific planter. So this association, again, with the, the, the oak and the jay, the oak needs its acorn to travel a certain distance away from the shade that itself, the parent plant, is providing in order for that sapling to be able to generate in the light. That's what the jay does for the oak. So tens of thousands of jay-planted plant, jay oak saplings in the southern block by the time we reintroduced animals. And all the ones that were out in the open got very quickly browsed off. But this one, you can see the little green shoot, I can highlight it, the green, um, is, is an oak that is successfully protected by thorny scrub. 
nature's barbed wire. It's ingenious. It was there all the time. We had this natural protect protection. And this is how, how trees regenerate in the presence of grazing animals. It's thorny scrub. So what we were seeing at NEP was a system that was commonplace in medieval times um, in the old forests. Now this is a, I don't want to use a thorny conundrum, but this is a word that we, we've completely forgotten about. We don't use in the right way anymore. Um, a, a, the trees in a, um, a, 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 a forest, if we think of a forest today, we think of closed canopy woodland. Um, We've, you even call plantations forests, but this isn't what the old word, word means. It comes from the Latin fore, meaning without. So forest really was that whole area outside the cultivated land that was used for, by the village for, um, uh, for, for growing crops. It was the wild area where the king had rights to hunt. So he would hunt through the forests with, for tarpan, ox, wild boar, um, bison, um, deer, um, and with his whole entourage and all his deer hounds, he would go hunting through the forest. You can't do that in closed canopy trees. You would kill yourself. What you can do it through an open wood pasture, and that's when you would see your quarry on the horizon and you would chase, the joy of the chase would be in being able to pursue a visible quarry. So ultimately, as we hunted our herbivores to extinction, um, we started to allow, the commoners were allowed to go into these forests to um, graze and browse their animals. So it was particularly useful for, for pigs. So the, with these great big open grown oaks and the acorns, pigs could go and forage for pannage for, for oaks. And also the commoners would collect honey from the forest. You can't collect honey from a closed canopy forest because there aren't the, the pollinators, the pollen species, to provide for the bees to do that. One of the last um, remaining um, forests, um, true forests that we have is a new forest. Again, you can see the sort of mosaic of habitats here. And one of the clearest um, dis distinguishing features is the gorse, this thorn. Um, it's just uh, worth this quoting Arthur Standish, who was a, an agricultural writer in the 17th century, talking about an old forest prover proverb, so old even in the 17th century, that the thorn bush is the mother of the oak. Without it, there'd be no timber in the common land. In the 17th century, forest officers were instructed to cast acorns and ash lays, ash seed, into the straggling and dispersed bushes, which, as experience proveth, will grow up sheltered unto, by the bushes unto perfection. So they really treasured their thorny scrub. In fact, they treasured it so much that in the 18th century, if you were caught disturbing it or cut, cutting it down, you got lashings of the whip and three months imprisonment. So then our idea of forest completely changed. And on the, on the verge of um, the 19th century and the Industrial Revolution, there was more call for timber. We wanted it faster, we wanted it quicker, we wanted it with um, a bigger diameter. We didn't have the time or the patience to wait for coppicing and pollarding. And thanks to this man, uh, a German, Heinrich von Cotter, he was founder of the Saxon Academy of Forestry, he pioneered the modern forestry techniques that we all follow today. So human planted trees, in a plantation in which thorny scrub has no place because you want to get those trees extracted very quickly. Um, and if you haven't got thorny scrub, then you've got no protection for your trees against browsing animals. So animals have to be excluded from that, that, that treescape entirely. So for the first time in the 19th century, we get this biological holistic idea of the wood pasture, the old forest, being separated into wood and pasture. Wood where there's no place for animals, pasture where animals can go, but no place for trees. It was a complete change that we have, we have inherited today. So nowadays, what do we do when we want to um, plant trees? We've forgotten how they could ever regenerate in a landscape without human hand. So what do we do when we want to try and stop rabbits and deer from nibbling those precious little saplings? Well, we put them in carbon-intensive polypropylene cylinders attached to tamarized wooden stakes tied with a plastic tie, Hugely costly in terms of carbon because they have to be produced or something, and, and, and at a human cost because it's a huge amount of work to do it. It's very labour intensive. Mm. Even if this area is to be ring planted, it is to be ring fenced from deer, these, these little cylinders are poor protection from the kind of damage that 
rabbits, voles and badgers can do. They're also very poor protection against wind and flooding and those, those cylinders can actually rub and, 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 and rub the, the bark of those tiny little tender stems as they, as they rise. Whether or not the trees survive, then there's a labour-intensive task of removing these cylinders because contrary to what they say they do, they do not biodegrade. I've spent weeks of my life <coughs> taking these things off of two plantations that we did before we started the rewilding project, project. Um, and which is probably a good thing they don't biodegrade because if they did, you get, um, you get uh, plastic residues in your soil and who wants that? They also pr promote fast growth. Foresters love that because the saplings can rise straight and tall. But we don't know that enforced um, growth system of that little sapling, that whip, searching for the light so quickly, what that effect has on a mature tree, say 100, 200, 300 years down the line. Does that in some way affect its resilience, its, its immunity? What I would say um, is that without having any surrounding trees in this area, without having your thorny scrub or any of your mature or veteran trees around in this landscape, these little saplings are being deprived of all those mycorrhizal networks we've been talking about and hearing about um, that will, will, will provide nutrients and, and minerals to those little plants as they grow. So that is certainly going to have an effect on their, on their um, ability to resist pests and, um, and climate change in the future. So at NEP we're seeing trees including oak, wild service, crab apple, ash, hornbeam, field maple, all these things spontaneously growing in our thorny scrub that are far healthier than trees that we, we, we could have planted from saplings, from nurseries. And remember where diseases come from, it's usually from a nursery, whereas where, where our, our ash dieback has come from. So, um, Planting re natural regeneration is also, in a sense, protecting against the spread of disease. When we first showed um, the Wood Woodland Trust around um, this area, they were so excited and they thought, this is amazing, we can do this without, it, can cost, it doesn't cost anything. We can regenerate woodscapes in our, in our land without spending any money at all. But then they thought again, because their whole paradigm, and this is true for any charity, any NGOs that, that are, are dedicated to planting trees, the paradigm is something that, that, that the funding comes from um, being able to know your exact um, costs and predictability, and messy, um, uh, unpredictable nature has no, no part to play in that kind of grant system. Also, the, the, the Woodland Trust and other charities depend on this story of physically planting a tree, putting a spade in the ground and planting a tree. And it's a lovely story, and I've done it myself with my children. I've grown little oak um, acorns from, from scratch and, um, and watched them grow in a jam jar and then planted them out. And it's a wonderful way of connecting people and children with trees and with the landscape again. But we have to recognise that this is a very artificial construct. And if we're doing it just for earning money, getting grant into the system, then I think there's something wrong and we ought to start looking at different paradigms to encourage natural regeneration again. And I'm thinking particularly of, oh, sorry, the Northern Forest. Um, because this is an area the size of Yorkshire that has already been planted up now. If we could allow this area to be naturally regenerated, we could save ourselves 500 million pounds and we could also have the most wonderful biodiverse habitat there is. Um, we could have thorny scrub, protecting the naturally regenerated trees coming up. It could be full of excitement, unpredictability, and we could have re free roaming animals in that landscape. A magnet for people to go and see and enjoy. It would be humming, thrumming with life. So really, um, I, I think we need to rethink the way we look at trees, how we want them back in our landscape, what that landscape should be, what these trees mean to us, what they can provide for us, and what they should look like. How much it costs to establish them um, back in the landscape in a plantation system, and whether we could be doing it in a natural way. <coughs> because if we want to re increase tree cover, but at the same time increase biodiversity and species resilience, then we should seriously think about places where we can allow thorny scrub to do the job for us and allow free roaming animals to react with that, interact with that thorny scrub and create a truly dynamic wood pasture system again. 
the old forest. And this means really taking our hands off the steering wheel and giving the driving seat to nature. Thank you. For me, I feel like it's like it's a revolution, um, and and I'm so grateful that you've had the been able to come and to be able to explain some of that and unpack it to an audience who really cares about the detail. I really encourage you to have a look at the book um, because she does go into a lot of detail. And there's also a lot of opportunity to follow up on different areas of research that might be relevant to the ways that you're interested in and working. Is there um, the yeah, so? Uh, so I'm conscious, unfortunately, that we're not necessarily going to have time to do questions now, but Isabella is going to go and do a book signing, and also we'll have the panel. So what I really invite you to do is remember and refine those questions, and we'll provide some space in the panel for going into more detail about some of the very real practical ramifications of that talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.